Okay, today we have a very long reading. So let's all stand up. We're going to read the entirety of Daniel chapter 1. So we're going to read it pretty slowly because it goes up to verse 21, okay? In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the article from the temple of God. These he carried out to the temple of his God in Babylonia, and put it in the treasure house of his God. The king ordered Aespinas, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defects, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Bethesazer. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard from the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azar. So they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better 
other magicians, the enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. That's a long, I think that's the longest reading we ever did, ever in this, in this service. But I needed you to read it because this book of Daniel is a story. This book of Daniel, you need to really understand the story and what's going on. So, around 600 BC, 600 years before Jesus Christ came, Kingdom of Judah falls to the kingdom of Babylon. Okay? We just read that. King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, commands his chief eunuch to bring youth with that blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, in that with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to king's palace. So king invades, takes over this country, and says, okay, I want all the really, really good, smart, good-looking kids to come and serve me. They came and they learned new literature, new language, they were given new names. What Nebuchadnezzar was trying to do was to assimilate the Israelites to Babylonians. Not all of them, the smart ones. He wanted to assimilate them. So what does is assimilate mean? It's the conquering country trying to obliterate, just completely wipe off from the face of the earth the conquered country and totally absorb the, the conquered country and annihilate its existence by eliminating their language, their culture, and their identity. Okay? You know, our... the country that I came from, Korea, we went through the same kind of assimilation during the Japanese colonization. Japanese started to occupy Korea in 1905, and they too, totally took over in 1910. Korean was, Korea was finally freed in 1945 at the end of World War II. But until that time, Koreans went through a massive assimilation attempt by the Japanese. So what happened? They came, they tried, they said, okay, no more speaking Korean. All the schools now is going to teach Japanese. All of you are now going to have Japanese names. Just like what Nebuchadnezzar did, they tried to take away your identity by your, your name, your language, and your culture and costume, and assimilate you guys. Come on in. Uh, You know, when I came to America, I was 10 years old. And I think in Korea you learn English now ever since, I think you're in elementary school or something. But when I was in Korea, I didn't even know how to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So when I came here at 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock, <laughs> when I was 10 years old, I went to school. Actually, they didn't really have ESL program back then, too. I mean, I was really old. You know, I'm old. So, a long time ago. This is when there was only one Korean kid in my school. So, back then, the teacher just give, gave me art book. So, all throughout the day, I did art. Except for math. Except for math. I knew better than anybody in that school. Because Koreans are really good at math. So when I came, I was in fifth grade and I was like tutoring sixth graders how to do math because their math, I, I did that math when I was in like, I don't know, first grade, <laughs> second grade. But the other seven periods, what did I do? I just drew <laughs> and I colored. <laughs> I did this for two years. <laughs> and just one day, I mean, I didn't 
I guess, because I improved. And I just, I don't know why, something just, English just came out of my mouth, right? But in America, you know, they don't try to assimilate you or anything like that. But place yourself back in Daniel's day. How many of you ever worried about war? Let me see your hand. Okay. I especially worried about war when I was in Korea. When me and my wife and Daniel went to Korea two years ago, 2018, there were talks about, I mean, new, Kim Jong-un doing some nuclear tests and Trump was going to go invade them. I mean, there's all these talks. So when we were going to Korea, I taught Daniel, if somebody talks to you and asks you, if you speak English, that's going to get shot, okay? Because <laughs> they don't like Americans. So you have to speak Korean, okay? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what, Odisa was so. You can't say San Francisco, okay? <laughs> I mean, we worry about war for you now, when guys, CJ, or uh, Ho Chi Minh who graduated last year, if there's a big war in America, what are they going to be? They're going to be drafted. <laughs> Off to war we go, <laughs> you know, <laughs> basically. So, it's a very scary situation. This is nothing to laugh about. But we're living in America, it's a big country. But if we were in Korea, we're living in a small country. You could fight, you could battle, but your chances of survival is very slim because you know, Korea is like that big on the map. If you actually take a world map and just put your finger on there, you could cover Korea with just your index finger. So if you are there and you're doing frontline attacks, probably you're not going to survive. In this war, if I were to go out to war right now, I'd be afraid of my life. But if I was in Korea, I would fight to death because I know what's going to happen to my wife and my kid if we lost. You know what I mean? You know what's, I know what's going to happen. Daniel's not going to have this freedom. My wife is not going to have her freedom. So, as a man going on to war, I'm going to not be scared of dying, I don't think, but I'll be motivated. Like Ju Young Jae Nim, his wife, to protect. If Ju if I lose, something really bad's going to happen to my wife. Trust me, he's going to. You know, he looks so gentle now, but it's going to turn into a Hulk or something. You know, he's going to say, "It's get up, yo, bring it on, right?" So. War is no laughing matter. And in this time, Israel, Judah, Kingdom of Judah lost. So what happened? Dads died. And now kids your age are taken and sent where? Babylonia. So think about it. Daniel was about your age. You're going to be taken from your, your, your family. No more mom, dad. You get on this truck and you're driven, well, probably not a truck, probably, probably has to walk, you know. You go into a place, I'm sure you're going to ask yourself, where am I going? What's going to happen to me? Am I going to be a slave? Am I going into the mines to mine all night long? Am I going to have to, am I going to be whipped? Am I going to be a prisoner? I'm sure when Daniel first started to go off in this country, he was very scared. But then, he came to this new land. And this new land, it's like somebody from, I don't know, Wisconsin, Alaska, coming to New York. Wow, look at this city. Bab Babylonians. The kingdom was the greatest culture, 
city in the world at that time. They come to this, wow. And then what do they, what happened? They're not taken to a prison, they're taken to this nice university. Wow, it's better than my house. They're living in luxury. They're getting food, what? King's food. I don't know about you, but I'm probably thinking this is probably the best food. I'm glad my son Daniel wasn't in this Daniel shoes because he would like, probably forget me and wife, my wife immediately. Food! <laughs> Give me some goki, right? They're all of a sudden enticed with all this what? Comfort. All this delicious delicacies. But there's a trade-off. You have to give up your name. I'm going to give you a new name. You know, your Hebrew that you're using, you can't use that anymore. You can't use your language. You have to learn a new language. All of you who are not born here, who came from Korea, just like me, understand how hard it is to learn a new language, right? But then, you're told, you have three years, and at the end of the three years, you're going to stand before a king. This is not in front of a teacher. This is not even standing in front of a principal. You're going to stand in front of the king, and he's going to give you what? Examination. And if you pass, there's great things in store for you. But then you have to think, what if I pass? Not pass. What if I fail? What's going to happen to me then? Now am I going to become a prisoner again? Now am I going to get whipped? Am I going to become a slave? So in this luxury, there's conditions. You have to assimilate to this new kingdom. You have to learn the language, custom, culture, literature, as fast as you can, and you have to learn it so well that after three years, it's not even the university. Four years, three years, after that three years, you're going to get tested. And your life will depend on that test. Right? How many of you hate tests? How many of you are really good at tests? Let me see your hand. You know what? I'm really good at tests. How many of you get nervous before a test? Seriously. Do you want me to give too? Yes. Oh, I, I didn't know that. Yes. You're so smart. <laughs> How nervous would you be if you <clears throat> not your grades depended on this test, but your life depended on this test? Daniel was in this situation. Now, What I hear Daniel saying in, I think, verse 8 is this. So Daniel said, what did he say? I'm resolved not to defile myself. I am resolved. Resolved basically, I'm determined. I've made up my mind. I'm committed that I'm not going to be defiled. Well, the Bible doesn't exactly tell us what is about the king's food that's going to actually defile them? There's many people think maybe the food was offered to the idols or something like that. But no matter what the cause, Daniel knew for sure if he ate that food, what's going to happen to him? It's going to be, what does defile mean? I am defiled. I'm made dirty. I'm made impure. If I eat of this food and this wine, According to God, I'm going to be impure. I'm not going to be clean. I'm going to be dirty by this food. It's, it's going to contaminate me. It's going to pollute me. And he said, Daniel said, I am resolved. I am determined. I've made up my mind. I'm going to be a man. I'm going to stand my ground and say, what? I am not going to be defiled by this thing. Now, when I look at Daniel, wow. What courage. I don't think I could have that courage. I'm taken to this new place, and, she, and you know, all the time I'm afraid of being prisoned. I'm afraid of being in state. And instead of, they give me this nice place to stay in all this. I take a bath. They give me this good food. 
And this person who's giving me all this food, this manager, what am I going to say? I'm not going to eat this thing. That's from the king. Why can't you find myself? You want to die? Do you think I would risk myself because of that? How many of you actually do you think would have the courage? Daniel, do you think you could do that? Do you think you could have that courage? Jimmy, do you think you could have that courage to stand in front of that whole world? <clears throat> but this Daniel in the Bible, he lived up to his name. What was his name? What does his name mean? I know Daniel knows what it means, right? Does anybody else know what Daniel means? Anybody? Nobody knows? Daniel, can you tell us what your name means? Uh, God's evidence. Yeah. God, in the old version, it says, God be my judge. God is my judge. Daniel lived a faith. To Daniel, judgment from the supervisor, or even the king, was not so important. To Daniel, the ultimate judge was the Almighty God, and he was resolved that he was not going to be guilty in front of God. Understand? His parents named him, God, be your judge. God's going to judge you. Live the life as you know that God is going to judge your life. <sighs> Amen. This is why I named my son Daniel. He doesn't look like it now, but hopefully when he grows up, he's going to be resolved to say, what? God is going to be my judge, and I'm going to live that lifestyle. Today's message reminds me of the world today. Like Daniel, we live in this land of Judah under the guidance of our parents. We live with their Christian parents. We live under the guidance of our Christian parents. As Daniel goes to Babylon and faces assimilation efforts, we go into the world. We go into our schools, especially CJ. And so you guys going to go to college. And you will be enticed to be assimilated. Understand? Just like teacher James and Shion, when they went to college, they're under the world system and they will try to assimilate you. They're not going to change your names, but they are going to change your identity. Your identity right now as the child of God. Your worth as being the worth of God. It's going to be challenged and they're going to assimilate you <coughs> to give you what? New identity. Identity that depends on what you do, how much money you make, how powerful you are in your position. That you're gonna, that's going to be your identity that they're going to say, if you don't do well, you become a nobody. Your identity will be shot. This world will try to assimilate you it's into their identity system. Understand? This world is going to try to teach you the new language, the new culture, your new literature of this world, postmodernism. There is no God. You are the God of your life. Live to satisfy yourself, whatever you want to do. Your body, hey, it's yours. Do whatever you want. It's a playground. Go have fun. This world is going to try to assimilate you into its culture. As Daniel was enticed by king's food and wine, you are going to be enticed with comforts and pleasures of this world. Some of you are already enticed. So as Daniel, are you resolved to not let yourself be defiled? Are you determined to not dishonor God with your actions, your thoughts? Are you determined to follow the will of God? Are you committed to making decision to do what is honoring to God? What is glorifying to God? 
where you live the lifestyle of someone who knows that God will ultimately be your judge, or will you just go with the flow? Just what everybody else does. Will you walk on the broad way with every one of your world friends? Or are you going to say, I am resolved not to defile myself? The choice is yours. Resolved not to defile. Not all of you are named Daniel, but all of you are sons and daughters of God. And I want to remind every one of you, especially Daniel, to live up to your name. Know that God will be your judge. As we close, I really hope that all of you, that all of us, will be resolved to not defile ourselves against God. I pray that all of us will be determined to make decisions, like we talked about last week, to think and to live as if God is our ultimate judge. Because He is. This week, after today, when you go to school on Monday, when you are enticed to defy yourself against God's will, whether in the way you think, the way you talk, the way you act, the way you feel, I pray that you would stop. Stop whatever you're doing. Mentally, physically, just stop and think and be resolved not to defile yourself. Amen? In your thinking, in your talking, a lot of times we hear such worldly language all the time. Sometimes it just pops out of our mouth and oops, I shouldn't have said that. Sometimes you swear, it comes out, stop, think and be resolved. What? I'm not going to be defiled. Go to God. In His Word, that you went to God with in your quiet time, and pray to God. Let's all close our eyes. Let's all close our eyes, bow our heads. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Help us to 